Now, I just explained to you why I went go, go, MM, go, go last time, but why am I going MM, go, go, MM this time? Well, besides symmetry being a pretty neat thing, it just, it, uh, it just, it, it just is. Just accept it. Good God, why do you people have so many questions? I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Hello there, heroes. I'm the Orange Ranger, and welcome to another comically long review, Shattered Grid. Amazingly, this video brings us right up to the finale of this amazing story arc. Today, I'm going to be reviewing the final individual issues in both series run on this fantastic story. So, let's just go ahead and get started. Let's take a look at Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue 29, Go Go Power Rangers issue 12, and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue 30, which I can't exactly show you yet. Starting things off with issue 29 of MMPR, which has five covers. The main one is interesting enough, the sky over the command center shattering, as various rangers, primarily MMPR, RPM, and SPD, run forward into battle. The retro sewed cover is the Turbo episode Passing the Torch, as the new Turbo Rangers, save for Justin who wasn't new, make their debut. Forever Pink! Funny enough, I read on Ranger Wikia that this was the fourth Forever cover to be published, but the sixth to be seen. The fourth and fifth ones were shown off ahead of time, but this one wasn't. Observations this time around? Well, another evil ranger we've apparently convinced to join the fight, as SPD A-Squad Pink is up here. This is the first cover where I've specifically noticed a Ninja Steel Ranger. There's Ninjetti Pink. And I think this one up at the top is Ranger Slayer. I say that because I think this one over here is from MMPR Pink, but I'm a little unclear on which of them is which. There's an interesting cover from San Diego Comic-Con that's just Kimberly. It's pretty, though. And then this one. Yes, another honest-to-goodness Hyperforce cover. This one feels slightly more... legit? It has the retro-sewed border, and the Hyperforce Rangers are helmetless and displaying more of their traits. Huh. So MMPR-29 helps to establish the Hyperforce Rangers are legit. I wonder if I'll be coming back to that point. So it's been unclear what Lord Draken has been doing with the Rangers that he's defeated. I mean, he's shown no hesitation to kill in the past, right? But the start here seems to set us at ease on that. Kelsey, the yellow Lightspeed Rescue Ranger, is doing push-ups in her cell, but TJ, the blue Space Ranger, calls her out on her counting. Note here, the last time we saw TJ, he was floating unprotected in space as punishment for being a dick to Andros and Alpha. So it seems like Draken rescued him to keep him captive. In the command center, the rangers have formed a bigger core team and discussed things. We get a better sense of what Draken is trying to accomplish. By capturing morphers and adding their powers to his own, he's making his powers more resonant to the morphing grid. If he can become personally similar enough to the morphing grid, he will be able to enter it physically. However, since these powers are not really supposed to exist in the same time, same dimension, same places, etc., not to mention also passing powers out to his sentries like Candy, this is what is shattering reality. Ninjor shows the rangers a tower that Draken is using to transmit the stolen powers to his sentries. It's kind of like a Netflix server for ranger powers. I'd like to take the chance to note here that I am not exactly immune to making mistakes. We've seen this tower referenced in a hologram, actually, just like this, in a previous issue with Draken and Finster 5 discussing it, and at the time, I implied that it was Terra Venture under construction. Once that video was posted, I realized that that didn't really make any sense because Promethea already exists. Oops. Don't worry, Jacques. Soon God will exact his revenge upon us for our imperfections. 
Jason introduces the group to two very strong, intelligent women. One of them is Dr. K, who many of them already met in Corinth. The other is Grace Sterling. Interesting. It seems that with the fate of reality on the line, Jason swallowed his pride and asked Grace for Prometheus' help again. Anyway, the two of them will be augmenting all the morphers in the house, so no more worrying about the Black Dragon cannons. Also, Alpha put out a call across the grid, and the barriers between dimensions are now so weak that you can just ask Siri for directions to 123 Command Center Lane and get them, so come on over. Jason says the plan is simple. They are heading for the tower to destroy it. No more tower, no more sentries. Simple. Jason asks if there are any questions, and Carter asks where exactly they are right now. Um, the command center, right? Well, yes and no. It turns out, pretty wisely, I think, they're actually hidden out in the pocket dimension, which Billy explains. Carone asks if it has to be so dark, and Zack admits he was going for a movie-type here's the plan ambiance. But then the rangers hear a coom, and Alpha says a ship has entered the atmosphere and is headed straight for the command center. It looks like it might be a time ship, but smaller. A time pod? A tide pod? What was I talking about again? Anyway, it's not a Time Force Ranger that pops out, but Andros, the Red Space Ranger. With a broken visor, he tells Carone, who for convenient family type reasons was the first person to get out of the command center, that he knows where Draken is keeping the survivors. At Draken's palace, it's the aftermath of Ninjor's escape. Another red sentry calls Skull's betrayal unfathomable. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. But Draken says she should have chosen her words more carefully. Unfathomable implies incompetence. Is that what you're telling me? That you are incompetent? This is what it's taken to finally get Draken mad, to crack that Machiavellian veneer and really concern him. When he asks if the Sentry realizes what they've lost and the Coinless have now gained, Skull is dragged in and he says, oh, he knows this one. The key to beating you and finally tearing this whole godforsaken nightmare down. Kinda calling myself out today, but I mean, this is deserved. I completely did not realize that Skull had been captured. I mean, it's clear as day looking back on it because only Ninjor and Zack Prime escaped from the palace. I guess I was just so focused on the fact that Coinless Zack had died that I completely missed out on the fact that Skull wasn't with them either. You done fuck it up! Draken is actually surprised that Skull really seems to believe what he's saying. That even though his betrayal is going to have cost him everything, that he has done the right thing. He actually really admires that. Maybe that admiration is why he grants Skull a quick and painless death, snapping his neck. It's the Red Sentry, a Commander Fa, that will pay the true price, relieved and taken down below. Finster 5 says he has some good news. He has located the Ranger Slayer. Two days ago, he was able to get a message from her via the Crystal, reporting that she was too far in the past. Draken says that they could use her help and orders her returned immediately, but Finster 5 says that's not possible right now. She's gone too far back in time, to a point where the timeline is stable and you can't just leap around the dimensions like puddles. He says he can't open a portal to speak with her, and Draken orders it done, calling out to his Ranger Slayer. And here we've reached what I was talking about last week in the order of the videos. We are about to see Draken's conversation with Sally Slayer from the other side of the portal. Go Go Power Rangers 11 and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 29 take place at the same time, relatively speaking, kind of like a crossover episode of a TV show, even if one of them takes place in the future. That's why I reviewed Mighty Morphin 28 between GoGo -Go Power Rangers 10 and 11. I knew that GoGo -Go Power Rangers 11 and Mighty Morphin Issue 29 connect right here. 
All right. Let's get started before my headache gets any worse. The conversation between the two is obviously exactly the same because it wouldn't make any sense for it not to be. The only difference is we get to see Finster 5 whispering to Draken that something seems different about her. Well, she did just drink like eight chocolate milkshakes. She probably seems just a little bit bloated. The difference holds into the next page as after Sally questions if killing Tommy was wise, it's Finster 5 that first notices that she doesn't have her bow. The portal closes. Draken says that they have to move quickly to take care of her before she can impact things, but then he collapses in pain. Finster 5 says his body can't take much more of this. So many different power signatures are tearing him apart. He says the fact that their enemies have Ninjor means they have to press on quickly as they are going to figure things out. Finster 5 says the grid isn't in any better shape. It's near its breaking point. But Draken says it will hold just long enough. Finster 5... I'm hesitant. The Rangers and others are hard at work, and interestingly enough, I think this is supposed to be coinless trainee, showing that even the coinless are helping out here. Andros explains what happened, and it also shed some light on their annual story. The Space Rangers were sitting there waiting, doing nothing, because Andros had a contact who said they knew where Astronema was. Of course, it seems like he would have told the others, but maybe this is early on during In Space when he didn't totally trust them yet? Draken attacked and apparently captured TJ, again rescuing him from the cold airlessness of space, and Andros was able to track him. I'm not sure how. Draken had his morpher. Maybe something in his uniform? Andros says they have to get TJ back as he considers the Space Rangers the only family he has left. Ah, uh, nothing like keeping vital mission details from those that you consider your family, huh, Andros? This statement obviously impacts Carone, his sister. Andros hasn't seen her without a helmet yet, so he doesn't know who she is. Jen figures this out and approaches her, encouraging her to just go tell him. She does, and he's shocked and thrilled to see her, meaning that they do eventually rescue her in the future. Zordon and Doggy... Hi, doggy. There, I made a room joke in this. Happy? Zordon and Kruger look on, happy for any moments of joy in this situation. Kruger gives his condolences to Zordon about Tommy and talks about how as leaders, they can prepare their teams as best they can, but it's eventually up to them. Kruger does mention losing teams to the great unknown, likely meaning he's not at the point where he knows what happened to A-Squad. Though, interestingly, he just fought them in Corinth, so... Hmm. Zordon responds that if they're lucky, the ones they lead can learn the most from their leader's mistakes. It's classic Zordon, wanting more than anything else for his rangers to avoid the pain that he has experienced. Meanwhile, the comic does touch back on the fact that Jason called on Grace's help again. He wasn't sure she'd come. She wasn't sure he'd call. But reality is at stake. Besides that, Jason thought about what Zordon said about making the wrong decision for the right reason. In this case, he was right that Grace does things dangerously, but refusing her help at that time may have been the wrong move. Besides, they know they can unfortunately now share the pain of having lost a team member. Andros interrupts, asking if they can actually pull off a rescue mission to Draken's moon base. Kruger agrees, wondering if they can actually spare the number of rangers that will be needed to do it. Grace said that she left rangers to die on the moon once, and she's not going to do it again. Um, technically speaking, you left dead rangers on the moon, but sure. Kruger basically says, You're gonna need a bigger boat. Grace says they can take her car. And by car, I mean her space station. In case it has not been made clear yet, I've actually pretty much just come out and said it already, but let's just spell it out here. Promethea is Terra Venture. We even have a moment where Carone realizes that Grace built it, and Grace learns that Terra Venture is its new name in the future. Terra Vent... Promethe... 
the colony ship obviously has the room, but not the complete capability. At this point in time, it's not 100% of what Terra Venture would eventually become, so Grace suggests that a select team go on the mission. Alpha says that speaking of Rangers, his distress call has been answered. Rangers are starting to arrive. The Rangers step outside, but nobody's there. Alpha says they should be there, and Billy suggests there may be a temporal delay. And that's what it is, because Trini points to the sky, and streaks of color start to appear. A lot of streaks of color. Reinforcements have arrived, and that's putting it lightly. Now, while a front quartet of Zeo Gold, Magna Defender, Phantom Ranger, and Quantum Ranger is not anything that you would dismiss, it's actually the third row that draws the most attention. So over here on the left, yeah, that's the red, blue, and yellow Beast Morpher Rangers. For the record, this was to my memory just after we learned that Go Busters was getting adapted. Oh, that wasn't exciting as the Rangers standing next to them, though. We rubbed our eyes, we looked at it carefully, we drank this moment in and nearly screamed in morphin' joy. Yes, heroes! These are the Hyperforce Rangers, appearing in the story, not just on the cover. This just felt like such an acknowledgement. The Hyperforce Rangers matter. Their story is legitimate. It wasn't just this little thing that was off on the side on Hyper RPG, on the Twitch, the tabletop role-playing, roll the dice, whatever. It was something that actually matters to the canon of the Power Rangers universe. Shattered Grid is a story that spans the entire Power Rangers franchise, and the Hyperforce Rangers were included. And this even reflects the passage of time in Hyperforce's story, as Joe is the green Hyperforce Ranger and not the silver Time Force Ranger. By the way, way hey, hey in the back there, we can see Dino Charge's unfortunately non-TV canon, Dark Ranger. And there are no other Dino Charge Rangers present. Future Story is going to explain why that Ranger is there and why they came alone. As the Rangers contemplate seating arrangements, Kimberly has something of a revelation. They can tear down the tower and depower every single sentry Draken has. That's not going to depower Draken himself, who is still easily the most powerful Ranger ever and can break reality all by himself. Zordon realizes that and has spent many hours trying to find a solution. He's landed on... one and it's an iffy one. Kruger and Zordon, via a floating display saucer, are escorted down a hallway by... putties? Indeed they are, because they are having an audience with Rita Repulsa. Wow, 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 wow. This issue was spectacular. And I think part of the reason for that is that the story stops jumping around so much. We do go back and forth between the Rangers and Draken, but that's classic Power Rangers. Check in on the heroes, check in on the villains, etc., etc. We don't jump back and forth between multiple factions of heroes in multiple places, which I think keeps the story a lot lighter and just helps it flow a lot better. But we are clearly building up to something big. The Rangers come up with a plan, and their reinforcements finally arrive, including the Beast Morpher Rangers and the Hyperforce Rangers. Hyperforce bonus point. MMPR 29 gets a 6 out of 5. Now, what happened in this story helped me explain why I went go, go, MM, go, go last time. So why am I going MM, go, go, MM this time? Well, besides symmetry being a thing that's pretty neat, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue 30 is the denoma of this story, leading right into the Shattered Grid finale. So I feel like that has to be right at the end of this video. So instead, let's go ahead and wrap up the past's angle on this story, shall we? Five covers for issue 12 of Go Go Power Rangers. The main one is Sally Slayer, unmorphed in front of a larger picture of Draken with fire reflected in his visor. It's a nice, moody shot. Two white backdrop covers this time, 
morphed Billy and unmorphed Tommy. Very interesting. This is the first time Gogo has referenced Tommy Oliver in any fashion. The retro covers are Peace, Love, and Woe for the retro sode, and the movie homage cover is looking a little bit goony. I opened the cover to this and just laughed. I have made a lot of mentions of transitional captions, and especially how Gogo jumps around times and even dimensions itself. Well, here is the most helpful establishing caption of all time. Somewhere. Over the rainbow. Sally Slayer is fighting her way through Red Sentries as a voice from off panel comments on how impressive she is, defeating all of his rangers. She pulls an arrow and fires, saying these things are not rangers. Draken catches the arrow and wonders how they've been fighting each other for so long, but haven't killed each other yet. She jokes that all she's needed is a clear line of sight, but he says no, they haven't killed each other because they know that they're so much alike. He offers her a chance to join him, but she says that she lost the chance to save him a long time ago, knocking up three more arrows. He casts the spell that took control of her mind, lamenting that he had to resort to the magic that Rita taught him. Her eyes go all green and her mind goes all to his command. At Jason's house, he's pulling a real man move. See, he's taken Zordon's words to heart and called his parents together for a little powwow. There's something important that mom needs to know and you just need to decide which of us is going to tell her. Yes, his dad said you don't burden those you love with your problems, but Zordon's advice was kind of the opposite of that. When you love someone, you do what's best for them, even if they're going to hate you for it. His dad sits down and clearly is about to come clean about his medical issues. In the command center, Sally is still apologizing to Billy for knocking him out when Kimberly walks in. This looks real bad, like she's betraying them, and it was all a trick the entire time, Kimberly even morphing to kick her own butt, but Sally begs for a chance to explain. Of course, she doesn't really actually explain, being incredibly cryptic about it all. She says there is something she has to do, and when it's done, she will be out of history's way forever. Alpha calls, which gives Kim a choice. She can try to stop herself, probably fail and have her do what she needs to do anyway, or she can go answer the call. She chooses the latter and Sally teleports away. Kim gets Billy up since it's time for them to go fight monsters. As the rangers head to the command center and learn about the monsters, morphing and heading out in their zords, we see Matt texting all of them. He's following through on his promise. He wants to go investigate, but he's telling them that he's doing something crazy. He can't believe that none of them will answer him, and even tells Kim if anything happens to him, he loves her. As the rangers form the Megazord, we learn that one of the monster's names is Hammerdillo an armadillo with a hammer and a pension to rhyme apparently the rangers wonder if they should divide and conquer but billy says the individual zords are still too damaged to function individually the other monster is a lobster whose name is crush station uh it actually feels like a while since the comics have had the cheesy pun named monsters that we remember from the show Crush Station, that's kind of hard to say actually, zaps the Megazord which falls back. Sally gets to the Grave Zord, even apologizing to it for taking so long. However, Matt has wandered in trying to text the group that he's found an evil ranger and Megazord, but the text failed to send. The Grave Zord starts powering back up, knocking around some rubble and making Matt dive out of cover. This reveals him to Sally, who has removed her helmet. Matt is scared at first, before realizing exactly who he's talking to. He asks her for her real name, and she says that not telling him is one of the biggest regrets of her past. Meanwhile, the rangers are getting beaten around by the cheesy monsters and are in bad shape. But then... The Grave Zord dives in, slashing the monster away. Kim said she thought that she was leaving, and she says that she is, but figured they could use one last bit of help. 
Jason says that he thinks the Megazord is out of commission, but Sally says that she can help with that. It, is, is that... Are, are they... Yep, the Gravezord combines with the Megazord, forming the Mega Gravezord. <laughs> Sally has set the Gravezord on some sort of cooperative AI co-pilot, saying she has something that she has to take care of. We see someone dressed in green practicing karate very loudly in an empty building. A voice says that's not where Tommy Oliver is supposed to be. He says the gym was closed and he'll leave, but she says he won't, pulling an arrow on him. What is she doing? Is she planning on killing Tommy before Draken could get the chance? Well, we have to think over that a little bit longer as she misses her first shot. He tries to convince her to not, you know, kill him, but she says that she's not trying to kill him, but giving him a second chance. She nails him in the chest, and he has a vision of the Rangers, Draken, even the White Ranger, and Kim holding his dead body. And then it all fades. Tommy is alone again, and the arrow is gone. What just happened? So, that's what she meant. So here's an interesting little fact you may not have considered. This is a brand new Zord configuration for the Rangers, so they don't necessarily know what exactly they're doing. However, they still seem to be winning, as the Grave Zord seems to be helping them out. Sally actually even calls back in to say that they are the ones making the moves, the Grave Zord's just kind of helping them out, kind of predictive AI, so to speak. It fires off a tiger attack, followed by an Inferno Blaster, which funny enough seems to be performed with a giant power axe. The monsters are vaporized. Jason thanks Sally for the help, but then Billy gets a weird reading, and the Gravezord disappears. Sally teleports into an alleyway, clearly drained by the experience. And who should walk up but Grace, telling her that she's there to help, and they're just going to have to trust each other. Rita, meanwhile, is pissed about the failure and says clearly to defeat the Rangers, she's going to have to do something that she swore she would never do. The Rangers are resting at the juice bar, hoping that Sally found what she needed, though Kimberly says it in a proverbial-sounding way that she hopes she found what she needed. Matt walks up, making a joke about that sounding like a proverb, but then telling the Rangers that they do not have to change the subject. Yes, Matt knows. I mean, seeing Kim as a future Ranger, you don't have to go very far to put the pieces together now, do you? He tells them that he knows everything and swears he's not going to tell anyone. But he needs to hear them say it to him. Zack pretends not to know what he's talking about, but he tells them how badly it hurts to now know just how many times they lied to him. He swears if they don't confess to being the Rangers, he will walk out the door of the juice bar and never speak to any of them ever again. So, this is between a rock and a hard place, huh? This is all presented with the rules of the ranger being absolutely literal, hard and fast. It does not matter that Matt has figured it out. The rangers are still not allowed to tell him. The rangers all look around and away, Kim even crying but nobody says a word. Matt walks out the door as Jason stops Kim from chasing after him. What? I'm not, I'm not crying. I, I have allergies. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm allergic. I have... Ah, this is heartbreaking. Now, I will admit that the drama at the end of this issue feels a little bit contrived because on Matt's side of it, why is he insisting that the Rangers say the words? I mean, I kind of understand it. He doesn't want them to lie about it again. He wants them to be honest with him about it at least once. 
But I mean, if he thinks about it and he's figured this out and he knows who they are, if he thinks about it, he can probably figure out why they can't tell him. And on their side of it, they could just say something to him like, we can't, which would confirm his suspicions without technically speaking them actually telling him. The action is great as well, with the Mega Gravesword being a complete surprise. In fact, I'd kind of forgotten that that happened, so it was a complete surprise for me all over again. As a finale for Shattered Grid in GoGo, -Go, this is actually kind of quiet, not really as bombastic as you might think, but as an overall issue of GoGo -Go Power Rangers, it was pretty spectacular. Issue 12 of GoGo -Go Power Rangers gets a 4.5 out of 5. A few more covers to talk about for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue 30, as Legends Comics and Games in Fresno, California got three covers that reference other comic books. I'm not familiar enough with the comic book industry to know exactly why this specifically happened for this one store. Somebody can explain it to me, but hey, it gave us unique, interesting covers, like this cover of Draken basically ripping a Green Ranger suit in half that references Amazing Spider-Man number 238, the debut of Hobgoblin. This cover is a reference to the Dragon Ball Z movie Fusion Reborn. And this one references Marvel's Infinity War. Indeed, it does that. Besides that, it was a pretty standard for covers. The main cover once again had a spoiler-free version made, and actually I need to use that right now because what's on the cover is in fact a spoiler at this point. I'll show you later, probably next video actually. The retro sode kind of portells what we're in for, it's In Space's Countdown to Destruction, Andros Shattering Zordon's Tube. It's a black attack for the Forever cover. I see a Psycho Ranger that's clearly diving towards Zack's back instead of into battle alongside him, right? Armored Black Mighty Morphin over here. Oh, hey, look, it's Jamie, the 1969 Black Ranger. It was so nice of her to take a break from being dead to appear on this cover. And the cover I actually have is one that I can't talk about right now, but I will definitely talk about next time because I actually want to talk about this cover. La 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 Shut up! In Rita's palace, she is naturally taking a moment to soak in that Zordon, of all people, is coming to her for help. Doggy is snide with her, but she gives it right back to him, asking Finster if they have any collars on hand. He'd love for her to try it, but Zordon gets them back on task. Zordon starts to explain what Draken has been doing, but Rita has been paying attention, eating popcorn and watching the rangers scurry around. Zordon says that Draken threatens reality, but she's completely unimpressed. She's not worried about a power ranger ending reality, and these two are not giving her any incentive to help out. How about revenge for your alt self? Zordon explains that at the core, Draken's powers are still based on the Green Ranger powers and Rita's magic, and Kruger adds in how Draken killed his Rita and then sent his Black Dragon Zord to her. Cheeky! Zordon, however, has gotten the hint here. You just have to butter Rita up a little. He tells her that they need her to do what nobody, even her other self, was able to. Save them all. Finster 5 goes to find Lord Draken, reporting that the army of rangers are headed to the command center. Draken is working with the ninja steel that he got from Brody in the annual, having it melted down and now pouring it over Saba's blade. This is another way he's getting closer to the morphing grid. It's another connection point with ninja steel's connection point. Finster 5 is confused about why Draken doesn't seem concerned about the army of the rangers, but Draken explains that this all makes sense. Ninjor told them about the tower, they're coming to destroy the tower, but all that does is gives him the chance to take their morphers and finish the job. He sees faces in the molten ninja steel, a female one that might be Rita and maybe his own above it. I get it. I don't get it. He says it's time to prepare for battle. It's time to do, 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 do. 
The Rangers make their preparations as Jason makes a battle speech. Dr. K and Billy adjust morphers. Eric and Jen reunite. Magna Defender and Phantom Ranger talk about helmets, while Chloe apparently makes a burrito in the background. Jack and Dustin, two yellow rangers with hammers, talk shop. Trini puts the Black Dragon back together and... Hmm... A team of rangers approach Promethea, reporting for a separate mission to the moon. Grace tells Sally Slayer that there's still time for her to pop back to the command center, speak with Trini, for example, but she says she wouldn't know what to say, and besides, there's work to be done. Jason stands with his team, Lauren and Jen, and speaks to the gathered rangers and their army of megazords. But, but we, we fight, fight together. together. Whether, whether we stand or whether, whether we fall, we are the, are the Power, Power Rangers. Rangers. Power Rangers! Kim says the speech was inspiring, but he says Lauren helped him write it. But Jason has a special assignment for Kim. You see, Lauren thinks that Jason should be leading the ground charge. It's kind of symbolic. So Jason wants Kim to pilot their Megazord. But it's in Dragon Zord battle mode, a formation that her Zord is not a part of. Jason knows that and hands her the Dragon Dagger. Speaking of symbolic, she cries, thanking him, and assumes the powers of the armored pink ranger, hugging him. Alpha calls the rangers, telling them Zordon is in position, and it's time. The rangers teleport to the moon in Draken's dimension. I know that you know that I know that you know, so there's an army of sentries around the tower. And Draken has added Dino Charge Gold sentries and Jungle Fury Rhino Ranger sentries. Jason asks Lauren what she's thinking about, and she says how glad she is they got to... Cocoon! Lauren, please, language! One more reveal for Draken's forces as Silver Space sentries attack from above. Jason orders everyone back on their feet, and Lauren tells anyone who has a battleizer to activate it. Of course, she might still be a little shell-shocked from the explosion, as she activates Super Samurai Mode, when her battleizer would be Shogun Mode. Eh, maybe Jaden has that disc. The Rangers charge into battle. Rita, Zordon, Doggy, and Ninjor sneak into Draken's palace. Doggy wonders why they have to do this right here, but Rita says that magic forms a connection with a place. Draken's throne is a place that he spends a lot of time, hence it's the best spot. She activates a spell, and Ninjor recognizes the source, the Wizard of Deception. He implies that the cost of the spell was high, but Rita says, hey, she's the only one that can save them. From my recollection, the only actual cost to Rita was swallowing her pride a little bit. We've got a two-page spread here that's more than a little bit hectic, so let's do our best to kind of sort things out. The Rangers are trying their best, let's try our best too. Top left, we start with another incredibly awesome moment because heroes, that is the Hyperforce Megazord. The Zords fight, fight, fight as Mystic Force Yellow dives down to save Mystic Force Yellow. This is not a coloring error this time. The Diver is Chip, and the Div is actually Gia, using the legend powers of Super Megaforce. Two things here. Number one, this joke only really works considering that the art missed a minor detail. Gia should be wearing a skirt even when she's using powers that were originally used by a male. Number two, the last time we saw Gia and Noah, they were using their original Megaforce powers. Now, they did have access to those powers even during Super Megaforce, frustratingly enough for me if you watch some of my reviews of that season. It's just that if they were fighting someone as strong as Draken, why were they captured using their weaker powers? The Gold Rangers stay up high, aiming for the sentries driving around in these mechs. Jen asks Chloe if she has her scythe, since it might just be the time to use it. For the record, it is actually super unclear if this Jen is the one that sent the Hyperforce Rangers on their mission and knows them, or not, since either way, they've had some time to talk. RJ punches a sentry that Merrick was shooting at, but RJ says there are plenty more. Then Draken slashes Levi and reveals another reason that he coded Saba in Ninja Steel. 
because this somehow, and I mean, that was a phrase we used a lot in Ninja Steel, so maybe it's just the somehow power, this somehow gives him the ability to absorb Ranger's powers directly on the battlefield using the sword. Don't ask, I don't really know. I get it! I get it! I get it! <laughs> but they have a much bigger problem, literally, as Serpentera enters the battlefield. Now, in the Hyperforce Shattered Grid sessions, the story actually centered around a fight over Serpentera, so this is actually a nice tie-in. Or, that was actually a nice tie-in to this. Anyway, it vaporizes three Megazords, then looks towards the Mighty Morphin one. Kim calls out for an attack, and Serpentera eats them. Oh. Draken slashes an alien ranger, and Jason calls for the ground rangers to light him up. But Draken just knocks them back and takes Merrick's powers. Kim, who apparently survived getting eaten, uh, aims at Draken with her bow using the dragon dagger as an arrow. She hits Draken straight in the chest, but he tanks the shot and prepares to mess her up. But then he drops to one knee and sees that his powers are starting to phase, teleporting away. He lands in his chamber. Well, 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 Lord Draken. I'd offer you a seat, but it's occupied. Rita explains what she's done, how his powers were built on her foundation. He accuses her of making a deal with her devil. Interesting kind of reversal there, but devil making a deal with God? She says the candle will burn out his powers, but she's feeling a touch impatient. Zordon and Kruger object, but she says that this is their problem. They've never been willing to take the necessary steps. Oh, you should have just let her do it. Finster 5 busts in, zapping them with Lord Zed's staff because that's a thing he randomly has for some reason. He says he's been wanting to do that for a long time and realizes that Draken is hurt. He says the candle is taking his powers. Finster 5 smacks it aside, but that's not enough. Maybe you should try blowing it out. The spell has taken hold. Finster 5 wants to run some tests, but Draken refuses. He's too close to getting into the grid and the rangers are too close to stopping him. He orders Finster 5 to take him to all of the other morphers. Finster 5 says Draken is tapped out. Adding power from one set that he already has will introduce the instabilities he mentioned before. Draken insists, but Finster says it would be fatal. Draken makes it in order, but Finster 5 refuses. Draken pauses and quietly acknowledges this thanking his old friend for his years of faithful service. He then snaps his neck for the refusal, crying as he does so. It's a beautiful picture, actually, of Draken's schizophrenia. He hates losing Finster Five, his only refuge, more than you can possibly imagine. But he cannot stand for disobedience, and his goals are too important. As the rangers fight outside, we see that Draken has hooked up every morpher he has to the power transfer machine. He hits the switch, and there's a bright white light. The battle continues. Draken screams in pain. The battle rages on. Draken screams even louder. And everything fades to white. This issue is basically one gigantic battle scene, but I'm absolutely okay with that for two reasons. Number one is that they spent the appropriate amount of time setting it up, quiet preparations on both sides before the battle finally begins, and then all hell breaks loose. The second is that it's just a great battle sequence, ebbing and flowing, 
victories and defeats and the story flows through it. A good battle sequence continues your story. A bad battle sequence interrupts your story. This definitely continued the story, and my favorite part is there's just this growing sense of suspense on both sides. Lord Draken is getting closer and closer to his goal of entering the Morphing Grid. But at the same time, the Rangers are getting closer and closer to putting a stop to him and finally ending all of this. Issue number 30 gets a 5 out of 5. And here we are. Next time, I'm only reviewing one single issue, and it's the one that brings Shattered Grid to an end. And there's really only one way to end an event that took place in two different series. That's doing a one-shot. Next time on a comically long review, Shattered Grid, I review the double-length feature one-shot, Shattered Grid number one. That is going to do it for a comically long review, Shattered Grid. Thank you, Hero, so much, as always, for watching. In the comments below, some pretty heavy stuff happened this time. Matt and the Rangers, all the stuff with the Ranger Slayer, and preparing for this final battle with Draken, killing Finster 5. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Also, let me know what you thought of my review of these issues. And while you're down there, make sure to smack that thumbs up button and let me know that you enjoyed this video. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel to see all of my videos and ring that bell. Get your notifications set up so you are notified of whenever I post more videos like these comically long review Shattered Grid videos. And if you'd like to lend any financial support to my channel, there are two ways that you can do so. You can head over to ko-fi.com slash videos. You can buy me a coffee that's set at $3. Buy as many of those for me as you would like. I greatly appreciate them. Or if you'd like to donate less or perhaps a different amount, you can head over to digitaltipjar.com slash orangerangervid. Toss whatever little digital tip change in that jar you would like. I'm grateful for anything I find at either of those sources. One more issue of Shattered Grid, heroes. It's a pretty amazing thing to think about. Until next time, may the power protect you. That's okay, though. That was a pretty good run. Also, also... So, also, Alpha put out a call across the grid, and for some reason my eyes just completely zoned out on where I was looking, because it wouldn't make sense for it not to be. The only difference is... I am hesitant. Fine, man, you don't get me grid. I want grid, I want grid. It's morphin' time! Shump. <laughs> Ah, uh, keeping vital plot details, go fart. Ah, uh, nothing like keeping vital mission details. Jen figures this out and approaches her, encouraging her to her farts. We can see the dino charge is unfortunately not why the Dark Ranger is there and why he's alone. If it is a he, maybe it's a sh no farts. Heroes, villains, heroes, villains, etc., etc. La 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 la. And that just made the story feel a lot lighter and I think made it flow a lot better. And I don't know the rest of this. Now, I finally explained in this story why I went go go mm go go last week, but I don't know if it was last week, so I just want to say last time. Now, I just explained to you why I went mm go go. I knew I was going to screw that up. <laughs> now, I explained to you why I. He offers her to join him, but he says, but uh, that's supposed to be she as the ranger. Wait. Yeah, so I have to write that down. <laughs> A few more comics, books, reads. Zordon starts to explain what Draken has been doing, but Rita has been paying attention. Paige. Yep. Ninja Steel's connection point, all right. Finster 5 is confused, but Draken explains... Wait, yeah, see? Of course, she may still be a little bit cell shell... <laughs> of course, she might still be a little cell sh Oh, God. Doggy wonders why they have to do this here. He, 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 here. Rita, Zordon, Doggy, and Ninjor sneak into Dracor's... Two-page spread here that's more than a little bit... Oh, God. I'm like, I've got to slow down. I'm starting to trip over my words. Two-page spread here that's more than a bit hectic, so let... Now, they did have access to those powers doing two things here. 
Number one, this joke. But the thing is that I don't. Oh god. A bad battle puts a stop in two and in a. And here we are. Next time on a comically long review, I take a look at that.